Canada is a country without a center, without a purpose, says Ken Coates, a distinguished fellow and director of the Indigenous Affairs Program at the Macdonald Laurier Institute and a Canada Research Chair at the University of Saskatchewan. It's a jarring statement, but it's one that Coates says is an apt description of the state of our country. Coates says on one level, the idea that Canada's future is uncertain seems absurd. The country routinely places well in global comparisons. Well, that is true. It also masks the reality of crumbling sectors of the economy. Investment in education, investment in natural resources, and infrastructure projects that are stalled or mothballed. I invited Ken Coates to join me for a conversation that matters about our need to turn our attention to the issues that are bubbling to the surface and could dramatically change our quality of life. Ken, welcome. It's good to be with you today. Well, what prompted you to write this column that you uh, stated what I had just read a couple of weeks ago? Um, obviously, there's big troubling uh, issues and you felt it's time to speak up. I, I really did, you know, and, and the issues are really kind of very complicated, but also very simple. I, I grew up in the era of uh, Quebec separation, of the Western Canada alienation, the rise of the Reform Party. This is my, my sort of political history as a, as a political observer. And, and despite having been through all of that, I've never been more worried about the future of Canada. Uh, because quite frankly, I don't think we care. I don't think Canadians care about their country. Uh, there's no sort of national core. There's no national center. There's no overriding purpose. Um, we've basically reduced politics to a game of, of a collective bribery where all major political parties go out of their way to say, oh, if, I offer, if they offer you $500, I'll offer you $600. Um, and we've reduced, we've reduced politics and national policy to a, to a sort of a self-serving game of, of, of both political aggrandizement, but also individual re rewards. So I guess I wrote this because I thought, I'm not so sure many people care about their country anymore. And, and that's such a hard thing to say. I'm a passionate Canadian nationalist. I believe in this country profoundly. I think our current government has, has led us in some very odd directions where we've, we've learned to sort of uh, criticize it, uh, to find fault with it constantly to make it sound as though we've contributed nothing to the, to, to the world or nothing even to our citizens' prosperity. So, so I'm, I'm deeply, deeply troubled. I'm very profoundly worried about where Canada is going. So is the vacuum leadership? Well, leadership, as long as you don't tie that to one political party, um, because it's, it's all political parties. You know, quite frankly, we've been for, poorly served by all three major political parties and the minor parties. We've been very poorly served by our, our premiers over the last number of years. You know, again, going this makes me all sound very old, but I remember the days of Peter Lougheed and of Bill Davis. You know, remember the days of, of you know, the, some of the great Robert Bourassas in Quebec and people like that. And even some, some smaller, you know, smaller province premiers who came forward, the Ed Schreiers of the world, you know, who, who actually had provided real leadership in this country. And, and, you know, most of, we don't know most of the provincial premiers anymore. Um, the federal cabinet has been reduced to, to uh, people who sort of serve the minister's, uh, the prime minister's office without, without any stature of their own. Um, and so you, so you have a situation here where none of the political parties have set out anything approaching a vision for the country. And I'll put it in this context. We've also never seen a world changing as fast. So, so add the list of things together. You have climate change, which is a major issue. You have the rise of China, which is an even greater issue in the immediate sort of term. You have the very serious problems that are going on in the, in the United States, where we sort of are recipients three to four years later of all of the chaos that happens in the United States. We see Britain falling off the European Union and, and, and moving away. Um, and then we have you know, technological change, artificial intelligence, social media. You have, a, you have a time where you say, tell us where we're going. What does Canada look like 20 or 30 years from now? And we have all three political parties or essentially major parties are essentially saying, I'll tell you what Canada looks like if you vote for me. And that's going to look like in the short term, not in the long term. So if you look at the, the list of things, trying to figure out the right approach on Indigenous affairs, we, we neglect rural Canada at our peril. And we continue to neglect rural Canada very, very systematically. We do absolutely nothing in the North. We're the most anemic northern nation you could imagine. 
And we have embarrassing situations in community after community across the country. So you add those things up. And when you have that many problems and challenges and issues, you sort of, not that you're looking for a messiah, you're looking for any political organization of any political stripe that says, we see the pieces, we see the challenges, and we can actually move toward the future. But we're not. We're scaring away investment left, right, and center. We've left ourselves on the sidelines of the major political crisis in, in the Ukraine and the, uh, the, the impending and actually current uh, energy crash that's occurring all across Europe. And we become staggeringly irrelevant, just staggering irrelevant. The world pays no attention to us anymore. When you get the, what's called the Five Eyes, which is a security agreement, uh, you know, supposedly, supposedly involves Canada, they're, they're moving independently without Canada. They, they make major decisions without really considering Canada's concerns. We are, we are so irrelevant, it's terrifying. We are one of the greatest countries this world has ever seen, and we're squandering it. That made me write that column. I got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So I come back to my question about leadership by, because as you were speaking, I was thinking, okay, and it doesn't matter which political party it is right now, the people who have chosen politics as a career rather than as a commitment to giving back to their country as a public service do so with the idea of, well, this is how I get elected and this is how I gain favor amongst voters. But leadership has to be about vision. The people who actually have that kind of intellectual capacity are smart enough now to say, I'm not walking into that political arena. Have we made politics so toxic that great people s stand by and say, I'm not getting involved? Oh, there's no question of that. There's no question that we've made politics un unlivable. And you said, you said, why are you doing this? We're, we're attractive. You look at the current cabinet, but also look at the current opposition ranks and you look and say, okay, how many people there are truly, truly impressive Canadians who, who've got a great track record, who, who stepped aside from, you know, 30 years in business or 25 years in the, in the, in working for unions or, or, or stepped out of the, out of the background from doing great work for Canada and said, I'm going to go and go into politics. Now we have career politicians in all, all three political parties. Um, we have a, a social media environment that is, is so destructive and so demoralizing in the extreme, um, and and we you know we no longer have you know sort of the, the sort of the calming media we used to have. 
you know, used to be you could watch the you know the national you know with Knowlton Nash going back you know, several several decades now, and you had sort of places where Canadians gathered intellectually. Well, we don't gather intellectually very much anymore. You know, we, we haven't found those common grounds where where people across the political stripe have a shared experience of anything, whether it's church or whether it's a national news or anything of that sort. And so, you know, we have a situation that is actually becoming very, very untenable. So we're getting good leadership in the world. Our, you know, Scandinavia is doing fairly well. They've got some people of some vision and some some fortitude that are showing up there. The Japan does surprisingly well. Same with South Korea, but South Korea's politics make ours look like a, a you know a playground contest. Um, we don't have very good political leadership in the world as a whole. I'm very concerned about what social media is doing, about how people are manipulated by social media, but both by foreign powers, Russia and China are famous for this, um, but also also by our domestic political organizations. And if you watch what's going on in the States and the way they use money to influence political processes, you can only be very discouraged about the future of, of, of dem democracy um, as a way of sort of dealing with these, with these kinds of situations. Let me use a really strange example. It's one I'm very uncomfortable about. We're in an age of rapid technological change, whether it's artificial intelligence and biotechnology, medical technologies, whatever else. Whoever, whoever does best in that world will succeed nationally, economically, internationally, right? Um, so who has the advantage? You got one advantage in the United States because of um, access to capital, access to venture capital, most of which goes into odd things and not, not very productive things and you know social media, video games and all that kind of stuff. The other advantage rests with authoritarian nations where they can approve things really quickly. If we came up with a wonderful new medical invention, it would take years, if not decades, to get it actually into production and in, into common use. China can do it within six months. All they have to do is get the science right and the technology right, and they can proceed. So where's our advantage as a country? And this is, again, where Canada frustrates me. Our advantage as a country rests with natural resources. You know, compared to other nations in the world, we have the minerals, we have the oil, we have the natural gas, um, you know, we have the water, we have the trees, and we are so poor and getting those things into productive use in a regular and, and, and appropriate fashion. So we are losing tens of billions of dollars of, ass, of, of investment every year. We talked before about the C.D. Howe Institute and its report that says we've become a, a turnoff for investment. And if you look at where investment is going, investment in Canada tends to go to places where government's the major payer. So into the healthcare system or something like that, or into post-secondary education, you know, pl places where the, the government is gonna pay the bills not the world paying the bills. And so we're, we could have been sitting on the greatest economic boom in Canadian history right now if we had done what everybody begged the government of Canada to do for the last six or seven years, get those oil pipelines, the LNG plants, get them in operation, we would be having the greatest economic boom in Canadian history. Our government coffers would be so rich that without going into deficit spending, we would be able to provide almost any social program you could imagine. We could become Norway and we've squandered it we could have put the money in the bank and then set it up as a national endowment that would have lasted us for hundreds of years. We did none of those things. We pretended we were open for business and we scared off, scared off investment like, like crazy. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you.
the climate, as I understand it, around investment in Canada at the moment is so poor that there are virtually no investment projects in the works right now to say we want to build this out over the next five to seven years. Investors have gone away. But at the same time, we seem to have stopped investing in our own infrastructure um, with infrastructure projects being billions and billions and billions of dollars just uninvested in building out the infrastructure that is going to be needed as we move forward uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now. So uh, I could not agree more. And I, we just happened to visit about a month ago uh, the Faroe Islands, which is this group of 17 or 18 islands of, in, the, in the North Atlantic. Uh, very isolated place, population 58,000 people. And they have done an amazing job of building bridges and building under, uh, and tunnels under the water to connect up these islands. And you look and go into northern Canada, and except for very few exceptions, some stuff they're doing in Quebec is really quite impressive. You're, you're driving on gravel roads to communities that are hundreds of kilometers away. You don't have proper energy infrastructure in the region. Um, and to say nothing of how long it takes us to build a subway system and a transit system in, in the south, we have paralyzed ourselves through regulatory processes. The, the end goal of regulation is fine making sure you do stuff that is not damaging in a, in, in a proper sort of way. But when you have mines in the north that are spending five years getting approval for a, for a, a 20 kilometer or 30 kilometer access road, and you think, well, who in their right mind is going to invest in this country? The resources are there, the global demand is there, the opportunity is there, the need in the north for and, and across the country for, for jobs and, and opportunities is, is there. Uh, but who would bother to come here? You know, you can go to you know, sort of the, the really strange countries in, in Africa where they're strange only in the sense of their odd you know, political processes and you can go through there. But there's lots of other countries in the world that are competing for the same investment dollars. And it, it worries me so much when Canada just basically says goodbye to all of those funds. You know, look at the Trans Mountain Pipeline still isn't built. And you hear environmentalists say, look, it's, it's gone way over budget. It's gone way over budget because of the regulatory demands and because of the protests that they've had to deal with. If you just had a government with a backbone that said, yes, we're going to build these things because they're in the national interest and we can do it in an environmentally sound and stable way, you know, we would be so much better off. Canada blossomed in the 1950s and 60s. We built things like the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Trans-Canada Highway. We built, you know, we improved the Alaska Highway. We built railways. We did all sorts of interesting things. And now we're just going to, I, I just fear what we're going to do is these, this infrastructure will sort of slowly decay. Uh, our country's competitiveness has already fallen uh, well behind that of other nations, including the United States, but not exclusively there. Um, and we're not really a place of, um, of any kind of genuine excitement. And, and that is so tragic when you have a country as rich and as, and, and as influential as this one could be. I just finished reading a book called A New Spirit of Capitalism that was uh, commissioned and published by the Trilateral Commission. And it takes a look at what the impact of sort of neoliberalism uh, capitalism was, you know, driven by the uh, uh, principles, I guess, of uh, Milton Friedman, which was to maximize uh, shareholder profit literally quarter by quarter. And in doing so, we wound up fracturing ourselves from a, uh, you know, in a capital markets side. What this book said is we actually have to bring not, not just bring that manufacturing back, but we have to bring back a long-term perspective when it comes to capital markets, but it has to be done in harmony with long-term thinking with government. So the business knows what the regulatory environment is going to be and that they can a agree on what are the issues that need to be addressed. Is that a direction that we have to go in if we're hoping to stop the slide here in Canada? I, I believe so. I think I really like the way you described it. And, and you know, again, we're not the only countries that do that would, would consider that. This is how the Scandinavian countries succeed, right? But let me use an example close to home, which I think tells us how possible this is. And the examples close to home are Indigenous communities. Um, indigenous communities are investing very heavily. But in contrast to Canadians generally, who are investing mostly outside the country, Indigenous communities are investing very heavily. And you see major, huge housing projects in Vancouver. And you see the First Nation Major Project Coalition, which is getting 
groups of communities to get together and fund transmission lines or maybe even hydro dams and get involved in those kinds of ways. If you look at First Nations investing and the Indigenous Economic Development Corporations are one of the great success stories of the last 20 years. We have about 350 of these across the country. Some of them are worth several billion dollars. They're, they're doing really well. What's the, the key to their success? Their driving, their driving motivation is not pure profit. Their driving motivation is how we can serve our communities. Can we create employment? Can we create revenue? Um, you know, so we were looking at one, one urban reserve in the province of Saskatchewan, it's in Saskatoon, delivered $10 million back to the First Nation last year. Well, think about that for a second. That community, that's, that's more than 50% of the budget they get from the government of Canada for all the things they do. So they invest long term because they want to get the money they can use to support their communities. So we have those examples close to home. We have them in the province of Quebec, which actually through the Caisse Populaire, um, and other, other institutions is really committed to nation building. And if you look at the Plan Nord activity that's going on in conjunction with the James Bay Cree and the Inuit, the community, you, know, you don't hear protests up there. You hear the indigenous communities supporting properly done investment. We have the models in front of us. Do we have enough Canadians who really care about the future of the country, who are passionate about our long-term future, and who look to you know, pass the, the, the very facile promises that all political parties make, and I'll give you this and I'll give you that. And I've watched way too many elections in the last little while uh, to be very optimistic about whether we're getting the kind of political leadership we need and deserve. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So I should tell you about uh, two months ago, we put on a live event here in Vancouver called the Affordable Housing Puzzle uh, and how we could solve it. We had uh, the Attorney General and Minister of Housing on that panel, along with Byrne Christmas, who is the CEO and General Manager of the Squamish First Nation Development Corporation. And yes. here's everybody else on the panel talking about the uh, long drawn out regulatory process through to approval and Byrne goes give it to us we'll do it tomorrow uh, because they can streamline that process and Bill Gallagher I'm not sure if you're familiar with Bill Gallagher's yep. work resource rulers he says exactly what you did First Nations in Canada actually are the key to saving the economy in this country and I and I find it interesting that you point to what are the initiatives and the opportunities that exist with First Nations that can move projects and development forward in a way that the rest of the country doesn't seem to be able to right now. 
No, because I think we've reduced uh, the economy to sort of self-interest, and now we've reduced politics to self-interest. You know, so when people say, I'm going to give you this much of a child tax credit, you know, I'm sort of a very conservative, small-c conservative in this regard, that if you're going to spend a billion dollars, you're going to have to earn a billion dollars. You know, you're going to spend a billion dollars and hope somebody gives it back to you later on down the line. And indigenous communities are really learning that lesson. Um, and they and they are they are doing really, really well. And we have a number of examples of exactly that kind of mindset. So you look at the Squamish First Nation, they're investing billions of dollars in, in, in development. What are they going to do with the money? They're going to guarantee all Squamish residents a house in Vancouver. Well, that's a that's an amazing thing. You know how important that is in the in the local housing market. We could be far more creative uh, th than we are being, and as long as we didn't worry about just who's going to elect me tomorrow, and thought about where the future is going. Because I think the changes that are coming down the line are way more massive and way more impactful. To use a word I don't like um, than than we anticipate. You know, China's China's not finished with their disruptions. The Indo, Ind India is coming on as a major power and will not be happy with the way we've dealt with India in, in the last, last decade or so. You know, uh, Africa is gonna find its feet in due course. And these countries have opportunities that will, that will sort of overtake some of the situations we have in Canada. I just wish we had a country that was right now concerned about its place in the world, would stop the virtue signaling of our, our current administration, which is embarrassing in the extreme, and focus instead on sort of a, a, a real country for real Canadians. And, and Canadians you know, deserve better. But, but the flip side of it is one of the things about a democracy is Canadians and all other democratic po people get the, get the politicians they elect. And if they keep electing folks like that, then you're, it's telling us not just about government, it's telling us about where Canadians put their value system. So I come back to my sort of main point. Um, do Canadians really believe in their country? Are they passionate about their country? Are we falling back into what they used to call limited identities, where Quebec has certainly gone its own way? Alberta and Saskatchewan are planning on going their own way. British Columbia always, as Pierre Trudeau said, is on the wrong side of the mountains and didn't really understand the rest of the country. The Maritimes knows that nobody in the country pays any attention to them at all. You know, and so I, I think some of the, the fundamental underpinnings of Canada, which is a redistribution of income so that all Canadians get comparable level of services, I think it's kind of stuff's at risk um, as people sort of turn inward and look only after themselves. And, and what do you have left if you don't have those things? So one quick last thought before I run out of time. We take a look at PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. The number of votes that's needed to put a member of parliament in Ottawa in those jurisdictions is far less than those uh, are, that are needed in Alberta, British Columbia, Saskatchewan. Do we need to rewrite this so that there is a more appropriate representation in Ottawa? Because it is not equal. But it, it's not equal. <laughs> you can also say it's not very effective the way we're currently working it right now. It balances off, you know, the, the, the federal representation is offset if you have strong provincial governments. And when you have provincial governments, particularly in East, who are completely dependent on federal transfers, they're terrified of upsetting the government of Canada, even if they disagree with their policies. You know, so we have a, I, I, I would go one step further than representation and say to ask you whether federalism is the right political structure uh, for, the, for the 21st century. Federalism costs us a fortune. It costs us time, indecision, uh, in illogical sort of investments, um, gerrymandering of elections, but also the gerrymandering of the budget. We're, we're, we need to, ideally, we would actually sort of rethink some of the fundamentals of, of this country and, and make it into a 21st century nation. When you look at what social media can do, social media can be very good. It just happens to be very awful right now in terms of how it's being manipulated and used. Um, but in terms of the representation sort of side, there's lots of jurisdictions in the world that have figured out that small population areas need to be overrepresented in order to make sure that their voices are heard. Um, and, and I think the, the other issue we should be asking about the Maritimes is why, aren't, why isn't the population twice as high? Uh, they actually have decent natural resources, beautiful settings, proximity to the United States, proximity to Europe. And you think, what's the problem? Well, the problem is actually maybe about 50 or 60 years of waiting for the government of Canada to solve their economy. Um, the Maritimes will solve their economy when they take control of it themselves. Uh, they'll, they'll build, and one interesting example, to use Prince Edward Island, you raised that, 
Prince Edward Island is building a really diverse biotechnology sector. And they're actually doing surprisingly well. And they're attracting you know, we had a housing crisis there because they're attracting so many people. And you know, when, when the Maritimes has their own economy that is not dependent on federal transfers, you will actually see the population surge. And all of a sudden, this issue that you've raised will sort of be off the table because Nova Scotia will have twice as many people. New Brunswick will have twice as many people and we'll have more balance within the Canadian Federation. Um, but, you know, where's, where's the energy to do that? And where's the passion for Canada and even the regions to do that? I think we're, we're, we're looking after ourselves first and foremost and not taking care of the, of the country as a whole. It's a sad note to end on, but I think you're right. Um, thank you for your time today. You're more than welcome.